want to strike for better houses? asked Esperanza. That and more money for those who pick cotton, said Josefina. They only get seven cents a pound for picking cotton. They want ten cents a pound. It seems like such a small price to pay, but in the past, the growers said no. And now, more people are coming to the valley to look for work, especially from places like Oklahoma, where there is little work, little rain, and little hope. If the Mexicans strike, the base farms will simply hire others. Then what would we do? Esperanza wondered what would happen if Mama did not have a job. Would they have to go back to Mexico? Okay. And Esperanza, as the, as the union organizing continues, Esperanza is very reluctant to get involved. Um, and then her mom gets sick and she's hospitalized. And then Esperanza is even more reluctant to get involved with the union. Um, so the book really portrays both sides, both the reasons why people were in favor of unionizing and the benefits that were that people could gain through doing it, but also people's reluctance um, and the obstacles that were in there um, that stood in the way of their organizing. Okay, and now I'm going to read to you a little uh, section that talks about the discrimination that Mexicans faced at that time in California. Esperanza and Miguel are heading to a store that's kind of a lengthy drive, and she's wondering why they have to drive so far. Miguel, why must we always drive so far to stop at the Japanese market when there are, to shop at the Japanese market when there are other stores closer to Arvin? Some of the other market's owners aren't as kind to Mexicans as Mr. Yakota, said Miguel. He stocks many of the things we need, and he treats us like people. What do you mean? Esperanza, people here think that all Mexicans are alike. They think that we are all undereducated, dirty, poor, and unskilled. It does not occur to them that many have been trained in professions in Mexico. Esperanza looked down at her clothes. She wore a shirtwaist shirt dress, shirt dress that used to be Mama's and before that, someone else's. Over the dress was a man's sweater with several buttons missing, which was also too big. She leaned up and looked in the mirror. Her face was tanned from weeks in the fields and she had taken to wearing her hair in a long braid like Hortensia's because Mama had been right. It was more practical that way. Miguel, how could anyone look at me and think I was une uneducated? He smiled at her joke. The fact remains, Esperanza, that you, for instance, have a better education than most people's children in this country, but no one is likely to recognize that or take the time to learn it. Americans see us as one big brown group who are good only for manual labor. At this market, no one stares at us or treats us like outsiders or calls us dirty greasers. My father says that Mr. Yakota is a very smart businessman. He is getting rich on other people's bad manners. Miguel's explanation was familiar. Esperanza's contact with Americans outside the camp had been limited to the doctor and the nurses at the hospital. But she had heard stories from others about how they were treated. There were special sections at the movie theater for Negroes and Mexicans. In town, parents did not want their children going to the same schools with Mexicans. Living away from town in the company camp had its advantages, she decided. The children all went to school together, white, Mexican, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino. It didn't seem to matter to anyone because they were all poor. Sometimes she felt as if she lived in a cocoon, protected from much of the indignation. Okay. So, um, this is a story with a happy ending. In the end, Esperanza's mom um, gets better. They win some improvements in their working conditions. Um, and they end up with a pretty settled life in California. I'm going to read from you, though, a little bit from the historical notes at the back that explain some of the more real history that this book is based on. During the early 1930s, there were many strikes in the California agricultural fields. Often growers evicted the strikers from their labor camps, forcing many to live together in makeshift refugee camps, sometimes on farms or on the outskirts of towns. The growers were powerful and could sometimes influence local governments. In Kern County, sheriffs arrested picketers for obstructing traffic, even though the roads were deserted. In Kings County, one Mexican man was arrested for speaking to a crowd in Spanish. Sometimes the strikes failed, especially in areas that were flooded with people from states like Oklahoma, who were desperate for work in any wage. In other instances, the strong voices of many people changed some of the pitiful conditions. 
The Mexican repatriation was very real and often overlooked part of our history, which is a big part of the plot of the book, too. It's just not something I read today. In March of 1929, the federal government passed the Deportation Act that gave countries the power to send great numbers of Mexicans back to Mexico. Government officials thought this would solve the unemployment associated with the Great Depression. It didn't. County officials in Los Angeles, California, organized deportation trains, and the Immigration Bureau made sweeps in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, arresting anyone who looked Mexican, regardless of whether or not they were citizens or in the United States legally. Many of those sent to Mexico were native-born United States citizens and had never been to Mexico. The number of Mexicans deported during the so-called voluntary repatriation was greater than the Native American removals of the 19th century and greater than the Japanese-American relocations during World War II. It was the largest involuntary migration in the United States up to that time. Between 1929 and 1935, at least 450,000 Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were sent back to Mexico. Some historians think the numbers were closer to a million. Okay, so, <laughs> that's a dark, a dark chapter in history, um, but it's a really good book. It's not, it's not, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good balance between depressing and hopeful. Um, I don't think that it glosses over the history. I think that it portrays with accuracy the kind of conditions that farm workers dealt with before unions came. It also um, addresses from two, at least two different perspectives, from this economic perspective of a family who traditionally had a lot, didn't have a lot of opportunity for advancement in Mexico, but had opportunity for advancement that didn't exist there in the United States. And then also someone who was, you know, moving for just purely circumstantial reasons. Um, so it portrays Mexican immigrants as a diverse group of people and also American-born um, Mexican-Americans who are living in the U.S. Is that at that time. So it, it represents a lot of diversity within the community. There's also a love story, which never hurts if you work with middle schoolers. It's always like a love story. So... Um, I think it's a really excellent novel for small reading groups, for a whole class novel, or for a read aloud. Um, can I interrupt with a question? Yes, absolutely. Um, I just was wondering, like, I have some ideas, but um, do you have any suggestions for, like, um, you know, because I know that the Grishfield, for example, is not all Mexican or Mexican American students. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you're teaching this to a class with students of all different backgrounds, you know, how do you? How do you highlight something like this, you know, and connect this with like U.S. history or whatever, without, you know, but also like recognizing the other groups that are in the room and you know not alienating them, like saying, oh, we have to read this because I just hear kids say stuff like that, like, oh, why do I have to read this? I'm not Mexican or whatever. So. Well, I would connect it to larger immigration stories and talk about most kids in their mainstream history classes get two things that are big themes for the book. One of them is immigration because you know we're nation of immigrants and we've all immigrated at different times but there's usually the motivations are pretty similar and you see that in this book too and also diversity of experiences within a community and among different groups of immigrants and there's a lot of other immigrant groups in that in that book as well um, so it talks about the other groups that were commonly farm workers some of the Asian immigrants groups that were farm workers and um, the American born citizens, both white and black, who also, you know, poor white and poor black people who worked as farm workers too in that time. And it links all of them together through experiences of discrimination, like, you know, the reason they went out of town to go to the store and stuff like that. So I think that's a good way to do it. And there's also labor history, a lot of labor history involved in that group. And especially at the secondary level, students start to get some labor history dealing with children's labor and the shirtwaist factory fire and some of the other events that preceded, um, you know, the kind of labor concerns and the farm workers issue. So I would pull on, pull some of those, some of those things in. And I would also um, let students, you know, if they were doing a project, I'd let them draw on topics that were more personal and do like a compare and contrast.